Jota, everyone. Uh, so I'm Paula Morris, and I am very honoured to be asked to be one of the speakers today. I'm a writer, as John was saying, and I'm particularly interested in the role of imagination and creative engagement in exploring the Haraki Gulf, its physical shapes, its wairua, and its history. I mean, I've called this talk Imagining Place because every place we all experience is interpreted, distorted, and transformed by our own points of view. And some places, as you know, have to be imagined because they may be gone or lost to us, distant in some way. So let's see if this works. Oh, it does. Here we are today at the Auckland Museum, a place to which I have a strong sentimental attachment because the domain is where we often came as a family when I was young on a Sunday afternoon. My parents would sit on fold-out chairs reading while my brother and I clambered over tree roots. And at some point, I could usually talk my father into walking me up to the museum to visit Raja the Elephant, the Egyptian mummy, the Moa skeleton, and the Goldie paintings. It was a house of wonders to me then, the only museum I knew. Now, I'm older now, a little bit, and not fit for climbing trees. Um, and I've visited many other grander museums around the world, um, but I still experience a childlike thrill coming here. Raja is gone, as you know. The great ham sandwiches are gone. Um, older people remember those well. Uh, but the memory of the museum and of the child I was when I visited remain. Now, the graphic novelist Chris Ware says, everything we think of as real is still always our own fiction. We're all fiction writers. Now, I found it really hard to write this talk um, because I have deep roots in the Hauraki Gulf area and sometimes the tug of those roots hurts. Hotoru or Little Barrier, Parkery, Lee or Little Omaha are all totemic places in my family history. Hotoru is my papakainga or ancestral home in many ways. It's a place of unbearable potency for me. Uh, this is one reason I've never visited and keep putting it off year after year, even when I was writing my short story, Rangatira, and subsequently the novel of the same name. Now, it's true that I lived overseas for most of 30 years, so I wasn't really able to pop over. But it's even worse now, I think, now that my father has died, because he and I talked so often about going, and then it became too difficult for him in old age to brave the landing. The whole area is a place of many memories, family and ancestral, and of dispossession and loss. So it's a psychic landscape as well as a physical one, and there's much more to it for me than meets the eye. Um, in a poem by the French poet uh, Robert Denor, he writes, I have dreamed of you so much that you are no longer real. And this is how I feel about Hotoru. So just briefly, who am I? Uh, my mother was English. She moved here in the 60s after meeting and marrying my father in the UK, so she had no real desire to be here at all. <laughs> she, she remained English to the end. Uh, my father is the New Zealander. Now, his father, Alf Morris, was a descendant of the Wyatt clan who arrived from England on the Queen of Beauty in 1863. They set up a successful timber operation in Lee, and some of you may be familiar with their last place of business, which is now the Lee Sawmill Cafe. Now, my granddad grew up in Auckland, uh, but after the sudden death of his first wife in the 1920s, he had a breakdown and was sent by steamer up to Lee to stay with his Wyatt relatives. En route, someone fell overboard, and my grandfather, who was a champion swimmer, dived overboard to rescue him. And we still have the newspaper clippings and the medal from that. Uh, and by the way, when he got back on board the steamer, someone had stolen his wallet. Now, the family story goes, it was the good old days, the family story goes that my grandmother and her brother were on horseback watching the steamer arrive in Lee, and they saw my grandfather being hustled off, soaking wet. And that was her first sight of him. They got married in the, in the 20s, and they farmed in Parkery until the Depression drove them to Auckland. In another family story from the Parkery days, which I mentioned to, to Delwyn, um, they would drive over Parkery Hill to Matakana, where my grandfather was the projectionist. They would put up a big you know, canvas in the Matakana Hall, the old one, and screen silent movies. My grandmother would play the piano. 
They also say, they allege, that they had to reverse back over Parkery Hill because the car was a Model T Ford. I don't know if that's true. My family's full of liars. Now, <laughs> my grandmother was Henny Tekiri Parone, the great granddaughter of Tekiri. He was a 19th century chief of Ngāti Wai, Ngāti Whātua, of Te Kaoro and Ngāti Manuhiri Hapu. He established a stronghold in Parkery in the 1820s and was a dominant figure in the coastal uh, areas of the region with a pa at Omaha and uh, a home base at Hōturu. Now, seafaring, of course, was an essential skill to move between these different homes and areas of cultivation and to transport goods and cattle. He bought the schooner industry in 1858 as the centerpiece of his business operations. So he took people and goods like cowrie logs and gum to Auckland, Tauranga, Coromandel, and ports throughout uh, Australia and the Pacific. Now, on the 11th of September, 1864, Te Kiri sailed to Kauau Island to rescue 180 Maori prisoners taken during the war in the Waikato, which we'll be hearing about in a little while. Many had been captured at the Battle of Rangiriri in November 1863. All were able to return to their homes and avoid recapture. And if you think about it, um, this is not long after the Wyatt family settled in Lee. Now, Tikiri died in 1872, and he passed on Manu Whenua, authority over the land in Pākari, Omaha, and Hōturu, to his daughter, Rahui Tikiri. Um, oh, move on, I think. Rahui was born in Pākari around 1830. That's her standing. Um, her parents were Tikiri and his wife, Pepe, of Ngāti Whātua. She grew up at the beach, the pa in Omaha, and the hapu settlement in Hōturu. After the death of her first husband, Tehoa, she married again around 1860. So that's her on Hōturu with her daughter, Ngāpeka. And next to her, the other picture, is her second husband, Tenatahi, sometimes known as Wiramu. His mother was Pohehe of Ngāti Wai, and there is speculation ongoing that his father was Portuguese, a sailor. Not the king of Portugal. Despite our family's... Uh, what shall I say, delusions of grandeur. Now, he was born on Altea, Great Barrier, in the late 1820s. And at first, when they were married, they lived, um, they lived in Lee, in where our, the Pass site was, the old Pass site, where our Mariah is today. Um, but eventually, they settled on Hōturu. They raised crops and cattle. They had a small workforce, digging gum, cutting firewood, and preparing cowrie timber for the voracious Auckland market. Uh, Rahui inherited her father's business acumen and her maritime pros and maritime prowess, and Tenatahi was also a skilled sailor. Um, after Takiri's death, Rahui used man money from land sales on the mainland to buy a scow or sailing barge crewed by her husband and sons. And in the 1930s, James Cowan wrote, Tenatahi was a sailor and a scow owner, a real old sea dog. Well, I remember his round, merry face and his rolling walk, and his sturdy wife, too. Rahui was a first-rate sailor man herself. Now, in 1876, Rahui and Tenatahi uh, commissioned a new boat built to the highest possible standards from Angus Matheson, one of the famous Omaha shipbuilders. There may be relations here. Now, as many of you know, Omaha was an ideal center for boat building. Sheltered coastline, rivers, plentiful supplies of kauri and totara. And during the golden age of scows, which is the 1870s through to the 1920s, Omaha was one of the most important centres of shipbuilding in the country. Now, in 1877, Tenatai began racing this boat called the Rangatira in the Auckland Regatta, and they soon became uh, the boat to beat. It was considered so unbeatable, the Auckland Star reported that other boat owners were lobbying asking the regatta committee to consider a handicapping system. But uh, disaster struck in 1883. The Rangatira sank off Great Barrier after a, a big storm. Rahui and Tenatahi died, attempting, they almost drowned, attempting to return to Hōturu on an upturned whaling boat. Uh, the Austrian naturalist Andreas Reischek reported that Rahui spent 14 hours in the water fighting the waves. So here we are now at Hōturu. I have dreamed of you so much that you are no longer real. Rahui continued her father's legal battle with the Crown to keep a reserve of Maori land at Omaha and blocking sale of land at Parkery. And in 1897, she secured title 
to that Omaha Reserve almost 40 years after Te Kiri began the fight for it. But the Crown, as you know, was determined to take Hauturu, initially as a military base, then as a timber resource, and finally as a native bird sanctuary, ignoring its centuries of Māori history and areas of wahitapu sacred places. Um, the Crown would not agree to a small Māori reserve on the island or take into consideration in its sale price the value of the Kauri livestock and cultivations. Um, I know that many of you know about the Little Barrier Island Purchase Act passed by Parliament uh, in October 1894. An eviction notice was served and all the natives were given a date to leave at the end of 1895. Uh, they did not leave. The Nautilus came to chuck them off. They returned. So, at 5 a.m. on the 19th of March, 1896, the government steamer Hinimoa came. They anchored, they landed two boats, and this is what the boats carried. Lieutenant Hume, a Mr. J.P. McAllister, the Crown Prosecutor, his dog, an interpreter, a police sergeant, and 21 men of the Torpedo Corps, each with 20 rounds of ball cartridge, according to Charles John Alexander, who was a passenger on the Hinimoa. From the ship, he said they could see two or three natives about their hut, and it appears that these are the people this small army has been sent to evict. So five people were removed from the island. Um, they dropped off Rahui and her daughter Napeka at Omaha, arrested one of her sons, and then sailed off to Auckland. Um, the four male prisoners included my great-grandfather, Kiri Tenatahi, who was about 24 then. Uh, they were marched off by the police sergeant and charged with willful trespass on Crown lands. The New Zealand Herald observed at the time that there was something pathetic in this unfortunate Māori, meaning Tenatahi, being dragged away from his ancestral rocks by force and arms and suggested that the Crown appoint him caretaker of the birds and beasts. But there was too much mistrust between the parties by now to make this viable. Now, of course, Rahui and Tenatai sailed back to the island numerous times to harvest kumara, to retrieve pigs and cows. Tenatai continued to battle in the courts, petitioning the government over the forced sale. He never accepted the Crown's payments. My grandmother was born in 1902. She was the oldest child of her family, the Matamua, and she was sent to live with her grandparents, Rahui and Tenatahi, on the old pass site. And there she learned weaving and to play the piano and to ride around on her horse. The rest of the family called her Lady Jane because she never learned to do much work. Uh, she died when I was 14, and I never thought to ask her about any of this. We imagined, as so many people do, that the stories will outlive us but they don't. Uh, three minutes. I've got to talk fast. Okay, this is the, this is the Europa. Those are their graves. Let's move on. Three minutes. Okay, I'm going to have to go a little bit over. I'm really sorry. I'll, I'll read quicker. So, Hotoru is lost, and much besides. As anyone who's driven up to Lee knows, the sight of the island is dramatic. I grew up thinking of it as a place that had been taken away, a forbidden place, now only for wildlife and their keepers and watchers, and not a bad thing, and that I'd rather it was for birds and trees than for rich people on their helipads. But still, it was somewhere to be studied and surveyed and managed by outsiders. Now, in 2011, Ngāti Manuhiri and the Crown signed a deed of settlement, returning 1.2 hectares of Hauturu for a reserve. The settlement and its subsequent management remain controversial within our ahapu, and that's in keeping with the history of Hauturu. It's always been a contested place, a place of buried knowledge, disputes, rival claims. My imagination keeps returning to the moment of loss, the act of removal. All of us, as descendants of other people, all of us here have an inheritance, and that inheritance is our ancestors themselves, our tupuna. The lines to them are unbroken, and there are many lines, like the lines that make up a net. This is an apt metaphor for Hotoru, as that's part of its creation story. When Taramainuku threw his seine across the waters of the gulf, Hotoru was its center post, ensuring the net didn't drift away or sink to the bottom of the sea. And the painting up here on screen, by the way, is by the artist Mark Wooler, who lives in Matakana. Mark and I went to Rutherford College together. Respect. Uh, this is a painting of Hotoru by my cousin, Aroha Gossage. Last year, I wrote about her for Art New Zealand and said this, 
Her work is located in Pākehā and Hauturu, physically, spiritually, and conceptually. The essence of that work is wairua, spiritual essence, and Māori, life force. Without whakapapa, the unbroken generational connection to the past, its people and its land, Gossage's work would be unmoored. Her kaupapa as an artist is what lies beneath. Now this is a painting of Hauturu by Araha's sister, Star Gossage. Like Araha, she has a series of paintings set on and about Hauturu, sometimes evoking the form of our tupuna rahui. Um, my own work has led me to research Hauturu and its history and also to imagine it, because I'm a novelist after all. It was actually in this very building in 2002 that I first came across the image of Paratene Te Manu on the cover of Rangatira, as you can see. It was in the book Pictures of Old New Zealand, and this was the seeds of my story. Um, this is also the very room where I was presented the Best Book Awards for this um, in 2012. So I read James Cowan's short account of meeting Paratene, my, my Ngātiwai Tupuna, who lived on Hauturu with Rahui and Tenatahi. Um, it was 1895, and Cowan saw Paratene receive his eviction notice. The ancient warrior, he wrote, bent with age, would not touch his summons, so it was laid on the ground. He picked up a manuka stick and danced feebly around the obnoxious paper, making digs at it as though he was spearing an, an enemy. The old man said he was not going to court and was not going to leave the island. It was his, and he was going to die there. Well, of course he couldn't. He was evicted. He died in Nungaru in 1896, and we don't know where he's buried, probably out one of the poor nights. Now, I'll go, I won't linger on this. You have to buy my book, okay, to read this. Aha, I tricked you. Um, this, is, this is how I imagine Paratene Te Manu would describe Hauturu, and it's really fantastic and lyrical, and you really have to buy the book to read it, okay? Because I've run out of time. It's really, really good, just let me tell you, okay. <laughs> So this is the final slide, don't worry. You don't have to drag me off with a hook. This is uh, the painting I showed you earlier in this presentation. And it's another of Aroha Gossage's works and it's called Pākari Valley, Early Days. Now, as in many of her paintings of Pākari, the landscape has an eerie calm, a darkness, an absence that's both mysterious and highly suggestive. She turns her back here on the beach, away from the obvious view and into the denser realm of the past. None of us remember it when it was covered in kauri. We only know it as a valley of fields and farms. We have to imagine the past and reimagine it and reimagine it. And that's the challenge for creative artists to see beyond and look beneath. And just briefly to end, uh, my father, Kerry Morris, was born in Parkery in 1933. He was delivered by my grandfather because uh, my grandmother got the dates wrong for both her children and never made it to the nursing home in which she was booked. And in 2016, when we buried my father in the Urupa of the Omaha Marae, we threw in handfuls of sand from Pākuru Beach. Thank you very much. Kia ora.